Welcome to Steeplest Church. We are so glad that you are with us. Uh, and if maybe this is your first time and you're wondering, why do they call it Steeplest Church? Well, you're not looking at a sanctuary. Uh, you're looking at our living room. And Steeplest Church is a collective of home groups that meet via Zoom for a sermon, but we have our own worship, our own prayer, our own potlucks, all of the things that would normally happen in addition to a sermon right in the living rooms of our parishioners. So uh, if this is something that is new to you, that's what we are. We are a group of home groups uh, and, and we're all over the place. We've uh, got groups right here in Texas. We've got groups in the West Coast. We've got groups on the East Coast and uh, we're just really getting started. We started uh, and launched the church last November, a, a year and what, four months ago or so. So we are excited that you're with us. You're on the front end of the journey with Steeplest Church, and we are glad that you are here. If you're new to Zoom, uh, we suggest that you use the chat feature so that you can communicate with us. We're going to put verses in there. We're going to make comments in there. We're going to put the message guide in there. And there's all kinds of information in the message guide. You can also go to our website and download the message guide. But if you just use the chat, you'll see it's going to get posted. You can click on it, download it. Um, there's a place to take notes, all that kind of good stuff right there in the message guide. We've got some announcements. This week, first of all, uh, we have our Thursday night Bible study. We meet on Thursdays via Zoom. It's the exact same link that you use to get here, but it's at 7 p.m. Central on Thursday evening. So if you're on the West Coast, that's five o'clock. East Coast, that's eight o'clock. But we meet every Thursday for Bible study. And that Bible study is led by our associate pastor, John Jr., and uh, as a dad, I can tell you, it's been exciting to see my son grow um, as a teacher. So he is um, soaked in the word. He is all about the Bible. And it's neat to see him uh, able to interact in a new environment for him and teach. And it's been really fun. It's been a great Bible study. I hope you can join us. We're in the book of John. We just started chapter Two, if you'd like to join us this Thursday evening. All right, we also uh, want to remind you that there is a free spiritual gifts assessment that is available to everyone here at Cebolis, Um, and it is on our website. And if you have any questions about how to find it, how to reach it, anything like that, just contact us either through the website or if you're in a home group, your home group leader should be able to show you exactly how to go to that assessment. It's free. Uh, it's very cool. It'll help you discover your spiritual gift. It'll also let us know what that gift is so that if, if there's a way that uh, that gift helps the church, and that's what this is all about, is helping one another, we know that as well as you. So thank you for taking the spiritual gifts assessment. I think you'll be excited to see what the results of that assessment are. All right. Tonight's sermon is Doctor Says You're Gonna Die. And that's that's the title of tonight's sermon. We're gonna be in Acts chapter 28. We're going to be looking at the first 10 verses. Uh, and this is a continuation of a pretty exciting story. So I hope you like Doctor Says You're Gonna Die. Okay, that's what tonight's sermon is called. And I'm going to go ahead and pray us in and get us started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share what you did through, uh, in this case, Paul, but all of the apostles here on earth. Thank you that we have it written down so that we can talk about it, we can learn about it, we can teach one another and, and help one another, not only to understand what you did through the people like Paul, but also how that applies to our own lives. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me today, that you would have the words come out of my mouth that are exactly what this audience needs to hear, whether they're in my living room, whether they're in Seattle, Washington, or Atlanta, Georgia. Lord, I pray that this message tonight would be all you and none of me. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right. So, you know, as we've been working our way through the book of Acts, um, we've been hearing all these stories about uh, Paul specifically and all of these really kind of not just amazing things that have been happening to Paul, but in some cases, some really tragic things, some really uh, scary stuff, right? Um, last week, we heard, for example, about a shipwreck. Um, and I bet you've thought to yourself at some point during this journey through the book of Acts, you probably thought to yourself, wow, wh why, did, why did God let all this stuff, in many cases, seemingly bad stuff, happen to Paul, all right? And, and that's one of the questions I really want to deal with tonight. Why did God make it so hard for him? And in one of the letters that he wrote to a church he planted, and it was a church that he planted in the city of Corinth, we call that letter 2 Corinthians. And in that letter, he talks about what kind of God has put him through. And I want you to listen to Paul's own words as he describes his journey as an apostle. And we're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 11, and you're going to hear verses 22 through 31. So this is Paul speaking. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Am I speaking as if insane? I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent adrift at sea. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. You know, as we hear the Apostle Paul defend his faith and his hardships, I think he would no kinship with Job, you know, the book of Job. In Job 13, uh, verse 15a, Job said, though he slay me, I hope in him. I think Paul really would have connected with Job on that topic. You know, and did you catch the little, the little saying that Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians there, that passage I just read about being shipwrecked three times? Well, what you may not realize is the letter to the Corinthians, that second letter was written like four or five years before the shipwreck we talked about last week. So now he's been in another shipwreck. That was at least number four. If you missed last week, it was actually a very intense story. We, we talked about how Paul, a prisoner in Caesarea, um, the governor, Felix, had, had charge of Paul. He'd been held by Festus, the governor before that. He'd been locked up for a couple of years. Remember, he met King Agrippa. He got to share his testimony with a king. 
And then Festus and Agrippa, because Paul appealed to Caesar, put Paul on this journey to Rome. And so Paul got on a boat and they started traveling along the coastline of, of what they then called Asia, we today call Turkey. Um, and they got a ways into their trip and they had to switch ships and it was approaching a very dangerous time of year to sail. Um, we know from the passage that this is mid-October and between mid-September and mid-November, it was the worst weather of the year before it turned unsailable at all in the, in the dead of winter. So Paul appeals to the, the uh, centurion who's in charge of him, he and all the other prisoners. And he says, hey, let's just stay here. They were in a uh, they were still uh, in, you know, near Turkey. They were on an island. He said, let's just stay here. Let's not get on this next boat. Um, this is a really bad time of year to sail. Uh, but the truth is they were, they were in this little place called Fair Havens, and it was a tiny little town. And I think there was some pressure probably from the crew, and I don't think the captain really wanted to stay there either, because there was nothing to do. It wasn't a great place to stay. There weren't really services, not the place you wanna spend the winter. And then, so they say, hey, we're just gonna go up around the corner of this island. We're gonna to go to this little city called Phoenix. It's a better place to stay. And so uh, against Paul's wishes, of course, he's a prisoner at this point, right? Against his wishes, they start off on the next leg of this journey headed to Phoenix, but they never make it. To Phoenix. The, the, the boat gets caught in a nor'easter, a storm that blows them kind of the wrong direction. They want to go this way, storms blowing that way, and it pushes them across the Mediterranean Sea. And for 14 days, this ship is completely unsteerable. They are just blown by the storm. They can't control where they're going. And finally, the, the uh, ship approaches land, and to make a long story short, um, they end up running the boat uh, uh, into the reef. The, the waves tear it apart, but Paul had told the whole crew beforehand, hey, an angel of the Lord visited me and told me that we're all going to live. We're all going to survive this day. We're all going to survive this trip. We're going to end up on an island and we're gonna lose the ship, the ship's gonna get torn apart, but we're all gonna survive. And that's exactly what happens. The ship is torn apart, but all 276 souls aboard make it to this island, okay? And that brings us up to speed and starts tonight's message as we start chapter 28 in Acts, which by the way is the last chapter in Acts. We are really close to the end. We're getting close to the climax here. All right. So I'm going to read now, uh, starting in chapter, again, chapter 28, and, and we're going to start in verse one, and um, we're going to read, we're going to start with the first four verses. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness for they kindled a fire and took us all in because of the rain that had started and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now, it's interesting because these sailors would certainly have known the island of Malta. This is, a, this is an island that would have been a normal stop on many journeys, but they've come upon it on the wrong side. They, this is not the port side of the island. This is the kind of the back side of the island. And so they didn't recognize it when they got there and they find out that they're on Malta. Now, Malta is kind of an interesting name. Um, and depending on whether it was named um, in the Greek language or whether it was named in the Phoenician 
language. And there's some debate about that. And quite frankly, there, there are people who argue on both sides. Um, if it was named in the Greek language, then it means something like honey, because there was a lot of beekeeping on the island. There was actually, you know, that honey was a big deal. They didn't they didn't have all the, uh, you know, sweet and low and stuff we have. So honey was their, their biggest form of sweetener. Um, and so they, they raised bees on this island. And it might have been called honey. But I'm going to go with the Phoenician translation because the Phoenician translation means refuge. And for Paul and his shipmates, the island certainly had become a refuge. And I'm wondering... And I'm going to ask you your first question to consider for the night. Where do you find refuge? I don't mean so much where do you find protection from the elements, not that kind of refuge. I'm wondering, where do you find refuge for your soul? You know, for many people, they find refuge in a relationship or they find refuge in their money or their career, or their fame? Where do you find refuge? I'm hoping that you're thinking, I find my refuge in Jesus Christ. But maybe that's not the first thing that popped into your head. All right. The story's kind of interesting because we find Paul gathering firewood. Now, if you remember the story last week, Paul um, had basically, by the time the, the ship wrecks, he had become sort of the captain of the boat. Everyone was listening to Paul. And he had also even kind of taken charge of the army. He had uh, told kind of the centurion what to do, and the centurion was listening to him. And then we find here they are on the beach, and Paul's out gathering firewood. Now remember, there's 276 people that have landed on this island, right? Some of them are prisoners, some of them are crew. Certainly there were other people who could have gone out and looked for firewood besides Paul. But Paul's servant heart is always evident no matter where we find Paul, what city, what state. Now, I don't mean like geographic state. I mean, what state of being like, was he in prison? Was he, you know, uh, leading a, a small group that would become a church, regardless of what Paul was doing, his servant heart was always evident. And did you hear in that letter to the Corinthians his concern? And, and I have concern for all the people in all the churches. Paul was all about others. And then out of the blue, out of this bundle of wood he's carrying because of the heat of the fire, a viper comes out and attaches itself to his hand. Um, now, I think what happens next is rather remarkable, or rather, rather what doesn't happen next. You know, at this point, honestly, there's, there's, a, there's a snake hanging from Paul's hand and a, a deadly snake at that. He could easily have been like, God, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Here I am. I'm doing everything I can. I just survived a shipwreck. I'm doing everything you're telling me to do. And here's a snake attached to my hand. Are you kidding me? He could have easily been frustrated and angry at God, but he doesn't do that. And he could have been upset with the people around him. You know, he could have been like, are you, you know what, right now there's 275 other people, none of you could gather firewood. You know, I wouldn't have gotten bit by this thing if you'd have just helped me gather some firewood, but he doesn't do that either. In fact, what he does is he just basically shakes it off. In fact, we're going to find in a second, he literally shakes the snake off, but he, he doesn't really do anything. It's almost like a, ah, got bit by a snake, just keep going on. Now, it's, it's not like Paul didn't understand that he'd been bitten by a deadly snake. It's not like he didn't recognize the snake, right? He knew he'd been bitten by what should be a deadly snake. And kind of like when we started tonight, 
you might be thinking, you know, why did God let Paul get bitten by a snake? Was this really necessary? Why, why would God let this happen? And here's my question. Why not let Paul get bitten by a viper? Why not? Now hear, hear me out on this. You know, we're about to find out as we go through this story tonight that this event, this snake bite, has a profound positive impact on the people of Malta, okay? We're gonna find that out in just the next few verses. But God could have accomplished the task differently, couldn't he? For example, he could have had one of the sailors get bit on the hand by the snake, right? And, and, and he could have had Paul go pray over the man's hand and heal him. He could have done that, couldn't he? He didn't have to have the snake bite Paul, but it did. Now set that aside for just a moment, and let me tell you a quick little story. I was trying to kind of do some math and figure out something, and, and, and what, I, what I realized is if you compare the time we have on earth to the time we have in heaven, okay? And now I think you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, John, the time in heaven is eternal, right? It goes on forever. How can you compare the amount of time on earth to the time in heaven? Well, that's, that's true. It was a little bit difficult. And here's what I said. I said, well, I, I can kind of wrap my brain around a million years. Um, and I can even kind of sort of understand the word billion. I can kind of understand what a billion of something is in my mind. And I said, okay, just for giggles, let's pretend like eternity lasts a billion years. Okay, it obviously lasts longer than that, but let's just say it's a billion years. What is the 70 years on average that we have on earth compared to a billion years in heaven? And what I discovered is that 70 years compared to a billion is about the same as 30 seconds compared to 70 years. Now, why did I do that math? The reason I did that was I wanted to ask you a question. If you had, for example, a child, and that child um, had a terrible disease, a malady, something terrible, and you took that child to the doctor, and the doctor told you, okay, so here's the deal. If you don't treat your child, your child is going to die. But if you do treat your child, I can fix them completely and they will live a perfectly healthy life. They will live to be 70 years old. This won't affect them a bit. But for 30 seconds, they're going to have terrible pain. They're gonna suffer like crazy for 30 seconds. And after the 30 seconds is over, they're gonna be just fine. Would you put your child through 30 seconds of suffering if you knew they were gonna live a happy, healthy life from then on out? I think every single one of us would say, well, of course I would, 30, what's 30 seconds? Well, looking at it from God's perspective, What's 70 years? What's 70 years of difficulty compared to a billion years in heaven? Kind of an interesting concept. I want you to just roll around in your head for a moment. Now back to Paul. We know that in Acts 27, last week, Paul had a visit from an angel and the angel and Paul had a conversation. They talked about some different things. And I want you to imagine for a moment that, and I'm not saying this happened, I'm just imagine for a moment that the angel told Paul the plan about the pit viper. Because clearly the angel did tell him quite a bit of stuff. He said, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna you know, the ship's gonna get wrecked, you're gonna end up on an island, everyone's gonna survive. The, the angel gave him a lot of information. It's even possible that they had some kind of conversation about this snake. 
And, and I can imagine Paul hearing what was going to happen. And maybe the angel said, you know, hey, uh, what's going to happen is one of the sailors is going to get bit on the hand and then you're going to go over and you're going to, you're going to pray over him and he's going to be healed. And, the, and I can just see Paul going, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't have the snake bite the sailor. Have, have the snake bite me. I honestly, I think Paul would have volunteered for the snake bite. Would you? Would you volunteer for the snake bite? You know, I think all of us need to stop looking at things on a temporal basis, a short term, what's going to happen over the next hour, day, week, year, decade, and start looking at life through an eternal perspective. Think about it. It's been 2,000 years since Paul was bitten by this snake. 2,000 years. And in the last 2,000 years, Paul has experienced unspeakable joy. He lives in a place where the streets are paved with gold. The walls of his house are different types of gemstones. The Bible actually says this, by the way. He has had no pain, no suffering, no sadness. He hasn't shed a single tear in thousands of years. Do you think he even remembers the snake bite? Do you think he really cares? You know, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think the last 2,000 years, Paul has given it one single thought. You know, as we get kind of back to the story here, the natives were convinced that justice had caught up with Paul, right? They figured, oh, he's a, he's a criminal. Now, don't forget, the, the boat's full of prisoners. They do know Paul was one of the prisoners. They know that, okay? So they think, oh, okay, so here's what happened. Yeah, he survived the shipwreck, but justice isn't going to let him get away with it. Justice is going to kill him with the snake to make sure that he doesn't escape punishment. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, um, it may or may not be clear. They're not talking about justice in general. They're not talking about fate. They're not talking about, well, it's karma. That's, that is not what they're talking about. They're actually talking about their god uh, or goddess of justice. They actually had a, a goddess that they worshipped, okay? These are pagans. They, they worshipped the Greek gods, and there was a goddess of justice. So when they refer to justice, you'll notice it's a capital J, right? They're actually referring to what they thought was a god, and they thought, ah, our goddess, she's the one who got Paul. But listen to what happens starting in verse 5. However, Paul shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. Now, they were expecting that he was going to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. So they've gone full circle now. They've gone from thinking he was bitten by the snake out of justice, out of punishment for his crime, to thinking, oh my god goodness, he is a God. And you know, the truth is God, God didn't let him survive the storm just to let him get killed by a snake. That was never God's plan. And Paul knew it because, because Jesus showed up some time ago and told him, hey, you're going to make it to Rome, right? And I'm sure the angel reminded him of that on the boat. You're going to make it to Rome. So Paul knows that this is not the end. He knows this snake is not going to be his demise. But the interesting point here is that Paul gets bitten by a snake and suffers no harm. So my next question for you to consider is, what do you consider harm? Being bitten by a snake must have hurt. I'm sure it hurt, right? I, I can't imagine he didn't feel any pain. I think it hurt, but he didn't die. 
you know, I, I've had two knee replacements and I'll tell you, they hurt terribly, but I don't consider them harm. I consider them help. They made me better. Yes, it hurt for a little while, but now I can walk without pain, right? So it hurt, but it, what, it didn't harm me, okay? Paul had been in a shipwreck, but was not harmed. Paul got bitten by a snake, but was not harmed. Paul will get to Rome. Oh, and by the way, eventually, he'll be murdered in Rome. But he suffered no harm. Let me say that again. Paul will be murdered and he will suffer no harm. He's been in heaven for 2,000 years. 2,000 years from now, he'll still be there. When they murdered him, do you really think he was harmed? You know, these natives go from thinking he was about to die to thinking he's a god. And Paul's seen this story before. He has watched people respond this way in the past. Every time it seems like God does something miraculous through his power, the person that God uses ends up being thought of as having the power. So they see Paul get bitten by a snake. He doesn't die. They think it's Paul's power that's keeping him from dying, right? And I want you to think about this because this is the reason our testimonies are really important. What people think of us is important. It's, if it's bad or it's good, it's important. And the truth is, most of the time, people are going to look at you at one of two ways, especially unbelievers, people who don't yet follow Jesus. They're going to see you in one of two ways if you do follow Jesus. They're either going to see you as sold out for Jesus, or they're going to see you as a hypocrite. If you live like everyone else, they're probably going to see you in a negative light, and they're going to see you as a hypocrite, or they're going to see you on the other side of the fence. They're going to say, wow, this person is so different. I think I want to know why they're so different. No middle ground. And I want you to think, we, we do this all the time, don't we? we? We do this all the time. Someone has a lot of money. They're a billionaire. So suddenly we listen to them about all kinds of topics that maybe have nothing to do with business or money. I mean, we do that all the time. Someone's a good actor or actress. And so suddenly we invite them to speak to Congress about some topic that has nothing to do with acting. And, and look at the way we lose our minds when we meet some professional athlete, right? Someone's a great athlete, and suddenly we want their autograph. We want to be near them. We want our picture with them. Look, Kim Jong-un wants to hang out and be friends with Dennis Rodman. Are you kidding me? We look to other people when we should be looking up to God. So here's my next question for you to consider. Whose life do you emulate or admire? Whose life do you emulate or admire? And I do want you to keep in mind that if it's the life of someone like Paul or Luke, you're not really emulating Paul. You're not really trying to follow Paul because Paul was acting like Jesus. So when we try to live our lives the way Paul did, we're really following Jesus. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to be, we need to be looking up to God and not out to people. All right, let's close this out. Let's read the last few verses here, starting in verse seven. Now in the neighboring parts of that place, were lands belonging to the leading man of the island, named Publius. 
who welcomed us and entertained us warmly for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed, afflicted with a reoccurring fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after he prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and being cured. They also showed us many honors, and when we were about to set sail, they supplied us with everything we needed. Now, after all of this, after the terrible storm, they're in this horrible, can you imagine being seasick for 14 days? Oh my goodness, right? They go through all of that and then they crash on this island. They go through a shipwreck. Now Paul's been bitten by a snake and the truth is God knows we're human. And he gives Paul and Luke and Aristarchus, his traveling companion, he gives them rest and refreshment. Again, he knows what we need. He knows we can only take so much before we need a respite, before we need a break. And here, God provides them with some R and R. And it's interesting here, quick side note, leading citizen of the island. That is exactly the right description for this person. And that's important because Luke, who was, of course, a medical doctor, he was also a historian. And when he wrote the book of Acts, one of the things that really astounds people is how accurate his historical writing is. And this is just one more citation of Paul being very, very accurate in the way he wrote, Paul, Luke, in the way he wrote the book of Acts, okay? This was the leading citizen of the island. It meant he was in charge, okay? Now, he might, it, you know, it doesn't mean he was the richest guy, although he could have been that too, Obviously, he was a person of means, but it does mean that he was in charge. And, it, and it, the story tells us that his father was lying sick in bed with fever and dysentery. And this is probably something called Malta fever. It turns out that the goats in Malta, um, the, their milk often causes uh, symptoms. Uh, there's actually a microorganism in their milk. And it, and it causes symptoms that are very similar to dysentery that last for about four months. So probably he was sick because of food he had ingested, in this case, case goat's milk. Um, and we find that Paul goes in and visits him. Paul spends time with this man. He loves on him. He prays for him. And then he heals him. And the word here is miraculous healing. God worked through Paul and healed this man's father. Okay, this is without question, this is a miracle performed by Paul. But God's the one who healed. Okay, let's, let's make sure we're completely clear. God healed this man's father, but Paul was available to do the work God had called him to do. All right, that's, that's really, really important. Paul could have said, no, God, I'm not going to do it. But of course, he didn't. Paul was available for God to do exactly what he needed done. Paul acts, God does the work. As this passage continues, something interesting happens. You notice that it says that Paul healed the man and then all the other people came and they were cured. Well, that's interesting because it's not the same word. The word healed and the word cured are not the same word that's used in this text. The word healed is the word that we use for a miraculous healing. The word cured actually means received medical attention. So I don't believe this is Paul miraculously healing person after person. I don't think that's what happened here. I think probably Luke was on a medical mission. I think he became the medical missionary on the island of Malta because the the phraseology here is different, okay? It literally means to receive medical attention. So Luke probably was very much involved. Remember, he's a medical doctor, okay? I think Luke's the one providing the curing because he's helping people with their sicknesses. I'm not saying there weren't any more miracles. Perhaps there were. 
But that's not what the passage says. The passage says that they were all given medical attention and cure. And that's really bringing me to my last question for the night. Who do you turn to for healing? You know, the truth is that God uses doctors like Luke to heal, and he uses miraculous events to heal, usually involving prayer. And, and I, quite frankly, I don't really get either side because there are some Christians who believe that uh, God only works through the miraculous, right? God never uses medical doctors. There are actually people who call themselves Christians who will not visit the doctor. How do you explain Paul being, a, or Luke being a physician at that point? Why would he bother? If God didn't use doctors, why would Luke be a doctor? Okay, I, I think there's a very, very strong argument that God uses doctors. Even at one point, Paul tells Timothy, a totally different part of the Bible, hey, take a little wine for your stomach. In other words, take a little medicine. Do a little something that'll make you feel better. Okay, now on the flip side, there are plenty of Christians, including some big name pastors that you've heard of, who will tell you that miracles don't happen anymore. I, I don't know how you think that either, honestly, because I have seen miracle after miracle after miracle. I know people that right here who have seen miracle after miracle. I know so many hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of miracles that have been documented. The truth is God uses both. Sometimes he works through the miraculous and sometimes he works through the hands and feet of those people that he created. And that healing is what I want us to pray about right now. So will you join me in this prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you use others for our healing. And I thank you that you use the miraculous, the, the power that only comes from you for our healing. But I don't just thank you for our physical healing, Lord. I thank you that you heal us mentally and spiritually and emotionally. I thank you that you are at work making us more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we ask for your healing right now. We ask you to heal our finances. We ask you to heal our relationships. We ask you to heal our physical bodies. Lord, we ask you to, to heal our, our minds and our hearts and our spirits. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us energy and purpose and everything that we need to do exactly what you have called each and every one of us to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so what? Now what? What are we supposed to do now? And the first thing I want to ask you is, do you have an eternal perspective? Are you focused on the right now or are you focused on the big picture? Do you see life through the lenses of Jesus or do you see life through your own lenses, the ones you were born with? And I think we should all really work to switch them out and get rid of the ones we are born with and put on the glasses that Jesus sees the world through. Some of you know, need to know who Jesus is for the very first time right now. And if that's you, please reach out to Steeple's Church through our website, text me, call me, whatever it takes. Um, we would love to help you learn more and take your next steps because the truth is Jesus is God. He's the only one who can get you into heaven and he wants you to come. Home groups, download your call to action questions now. That's on the message guide. So go ahead and download those, print them out if you haven't already and answer them with your home group. You know, today we learned how uh, God used a little temporary pain to bring healing to an entire island. Well, next week, this story, the Acts of the Apostles, comes to a climax and a close, so don't you dare miss it. Thank you for being part of the Steeple is Church family. We love you, and we'll see you next week.